Oh, good afternoon. I'm, as I said before, I'm Bob Rack, and, uh, and I'd like to speak to you this afternoon. I don't think a lot of people understand how water, how you get your water, and also how we treat the water before it goes back into the environment. Because, you know, we, we talk about we turn on our faucet and water comes out. Well, where does that come from? When we flush our toilets, it disappears. Where does it go? You know, so one of the things uh, that's been happening a lot is that it's been out of sight, out of mind. And so people haven't, you know, the pipes are under the ground and all this. And we think, well, it's, you know, it's worked. All these systems have worked for the last 50 years. Why shouldn't they work for another 50 years? And so it's important that we, we understand because as we're voters and we have to go out and we have to fund these uh, facilities that we have, we understand about the, the water system that we have. Because if we think about it, we, have, we saw the picture of the earth before and it's a blue planet. And it looks like there's a lot of water. So what's the problem? Well, the idea is about 97% of the, 97.5% of the water that's on the planet is actually salt water and it's not readily available to us. We can actually take some of that water and desalinate it, which is removing the water, but it's a very energy intensive process. It's also, and so if you don't have water, well, you do it. And we have actually, we have two facilities in our area that are desal doing desalination, and I have, have had students working at one of them. And we have one in Dighton, which is the, uh, uh, it's run by Aquaria Water, and it's a privately owned desalination plant, and it takes water from the Taunton River and provides, they have a contract now with the city of Brockton to provide water for there. There's also a facility in Swansea, which is actually the first publicly owned water desalination plant in the country in the 48 states, you know, in some of the some of the areas like the Virgin Islands and things like that, they've been doing desalination for a while, but for some of the, the other areas, they haven't. And so we have uh, this facility right now that provides about approximately about a million gallons of water a day for the town of Swansea because the groundwater wells haven't been able to keep up with their, their water demands. And so we're going to look at, you know, what, when we Talk about the, the water systems in, just look, in, in Massachusetts. We try to manage things on what's called a watershed basis. And if we look at all these areas, the different colors represent different watersheds. And generally a watershed is an area where all, it's, it's defined by the topology or the, the hilliness of an area, and it creates like a bowl type thing that all the waters in the area. This is actually the Taunton River watershed right here. So all the waters in that area will actually drain out the Taunton River and come down here and empty out. Here's the, we can see this would be Narragansett Bay down here and it comes out here. So one of the things that we have to be aware when we're managing this area is any pollution that's in those areas could eventually be moving towards one site, and so coming down the, the Taunton River. And this is important because a lot of places, you know, get their, you know, in this particular, but in, in other areas as well, get their water supply from the river. So if I'm drawing from down here, which the, some of the areas are drawing from the Dighton area, where it's drawing, Pollution that could be in this area here can make its way down into the, those areas in the river. So we have to manage the area as a, a watershed and protect it so that the waters that are going to be used for our drinking water supply are cleaner. Because the cleaner the water is to start with, the easier it is to treat that water. And so some areas have like... Uh, some of the probably the best quality water in the country is New York City, believe it or not. 
And we think the reason for that is they get their water from very high in upstate New York. And years ago, they kept those areas undeveloped and things. And so they actually can have a waiver for, for what normally people have to do for treatment of water surface, which is uh, coagulation, flocculation, uh, sedimentation, filtration, those processes, they can bypass those processes because they're maintaining the water in a good state in those reservoirs that they have in, in upstate New York. But here, uh, I'll show you some of the uh, interesting, when we look at water quality, you know, this is, this is Fall River. And it's interesting, when we look at the shape of Fall River, comes around like that. And it, and it isn't shaped like that by accident. The Watupa Water Board years ago actually has water rights due to what we have water rights, riparian rights. So if you're bordering the area, you have rights to that water. So here we can see going down, the Watupa Water Board is actually uh, has uh, control or rights to the, the water that's in the area. And the Watupa Water Board actually has rights to Stafford Pond. They have rights to South Watupa Pond. They have rights to, this is Sortie Pond, and this is the Vol Pond. And this is the North Watupa Pond, which is our main water supply for Fall River. The Copacut Reservoir, which is a, a reservoir that was built in the 60s, where they actually put a dam right here to block the Copacut River and capture that water. And they also have the water rights to the Nokachoke area, Lake Nokachoke in that area. So one thing, we, we are in our immediate area, we are pretty blessed with water, you know, compared to other areas. But we still have times where, where the water will, you know, sometimes go down and we have to, uh, reduce our water usage in, in the summertime. And so if we look, as I said, this is our main water supply for the city of Fall River. And this is us right here. This is, that pond right there is this, right here, that, <laughs> the pale blue dot on this one, is, is our pond. And we're actually here, we're in what's known as the uh, Mont Hope Bay watershed. And the reason for that is the water that comes here in this area, we're right here, and, uh, and it's interesting, the water here, this pond is actually a retention pond that was built to capture the flow of water from the, from the college. And it goes in there. So it's a man-made body of water that's there. And from here, it drains out goes down here along the river, goes under 24, and actually combines on a stream that goes into this catch basin. And in about the turn of the century, about 1905, the city of Fall River forefathers had the foresight of building a channel that went right along this here, along this side. And it captures all the, any surface water that flows from the city and also groundwater that comes from this area. And it's captured in here and it delivers it into South Watupa Pond. And then here, this is the actual head of the Quickashan River, which is what Fall River was named after. Quickashan is Wampanoag for Falling River. And so that's where there are several waterfalls along the way. And there was a major waterfall right here in the city of Fall River, which is right now where the uh, Chamber of Commerce building is. Because when they put the highway in, our namesake ended up going underground into tunnels and stuff. So they're, they're trying to uh, bring it out in some areas as much as possible so that we can highlight the river. And it's actually a beautiful, Sorry about that. It's actually a beautiful walking trail that goes along the river. It starts right about here where Plymouth Avenue is, and it goes right along here, goes here, and actually crosses 
here, the, this is, uh, goes under the highway and crosses the Brayton Avenue right over there. And then you can actually walk and continue the walk right along the uh, South Wetupper Pond here. So it goes from about here to there, and it's a beautiful walk that's there. They spent quite a bit of money on it, and, and there's wildlife and things like that. So it really highlights the, the Quickishan River that's there. And it's actually every Wednesday now, from now until the summer, there's a, w a walking tour Wednesdays at noon. So you can go down there with the mass in motion and they'll lead a walk on the, on the trail. So it's, uh, it's really, if you can get there, it's worthwhile going. But getting back to our, oh, oh and so the Quickishan River flows down here. So here the water that comes from this area goes into the Quickishan and then goes down and empties out. This is Battleship Cove right here, and that's where the Quickishan empties out. So that goes into this area. This is another pond. This is Cook Pond. I grew up in this area right over here, so I spent a lot of time as a kid at Cook Pond and fishing and, and things on that pond. And so the water supply here for the city of Fall River, this can supply about... Uh, nine million gallons a day, safe yield, and the Copacut Reservoir can provide about six million gallons of water. And this area over here was actually protected from development, and this area right over here is part of the, uh, the new state 16,000-acre uh, bioreserve, which is an area, conservation land, which is uh, trying to uh, uh, allow for biodiversity of organisms in the area. So there, there's the, the Copacut Reservoir in this, uh, or the Copacut Woods and all in this area over here. And there is, this is Blossom Road that goes down by here. This is like White's Restaurant right over here, uh, right there. And you can go down that road and go down there. It's quite a hazardous road, you know, it's, <laughs> It, and for on purpose, they don't want a lot of people driving down there. But it is a, uh, you know, you, you usually don't want to go down there without a four-wheel vehicle or something like that. I've gone down to other cars, but you have to wind your way around going down, going down the street. But this is where this area was actually uh, the forefathers purchased a lot of the area so that to maintain it from being developed to protect the water supply. Right here, this is an island called Interlaken, and the Bordens had a, a mansion on that island. They had a farm and things like that. They had a, a working area. And so they actually moved the mansion off here, and it's somewhere over in this area. They, they took the mansion up and, and actually uh, produced it. There, there was a big ice house right over here. And you can see the remnants of that. If you go on Route 24 heading north, you see this kind of cement building that's on the side. That's the remnants of an ice house. And there was a big ice house. The ice house actually caught fire and burned down. But, and it supposedly took a year for the ice to melt that was in there. So it was, uh, you know, and they used to ship ice all over the, all over the place because they would, there's actually like a walkway that goes out like this and uh, that horses could walk out on it in the winter time so they could pull the ice and move it into conveyor belts to store it in the, the ice, ice house that was on this area. So this is the area right here where our, our current water treatment plant is. And so the, uh, the way that water gets from here to here is that the water is actually pumped into, this is the King Philip Swamp, and the water is pumped into the swamp. So there, there isn't a pipeline going from there to there. It's pumped into the swamp, and the water flows by gravity by several streams that go into leading into the, the North Wetupper Pond. And then, so then it's pumped here from a pump station, and it goes out to the, the various uh, water towers. Now, when we talk about uh, water quality, you know, this is, again, this is an uh, aerial view. This is South Wetupper Pond, this is North Wetupper Pond, and this is Route 195 here. At one time, these were all both connected, and there was actually 
boat transport of goods and everything up and down the, the pond to move things from one area to another. And then when the train came in, they put this, and then the highway came in. So there is a gatehouse right here that connects these two. Because this is our main water supply, and this is our backup water supply. So they can take, this area is developed, but they can take water from this pond and pump it into that pond if necessary. And they, it was almost, I think, probably close to 15, 20 years ago was the last time I heard that they actually had to pump the stuff out, it, for, pump water from here and open the gate to let water flow into there because of a severe drought area that they had at the time. And so this is our water supply. And, and if you're on the pond, and I've been lucky enough to be on the pond with the city and everything, you think you're up in Maine or somewhere, you know, because there's, there's no development around you other than you see the, if you're looking down south, if we were looking uh, way down over here, you can see the cars on the highway go by, but it's all trees all around it, and it's, it looks like you're, you don't think you're in Fall River. And, and looking at, back at that picture, you know, of Fall River, if we think of Fall River, only about, you know, this is the populated area. This is all Fall River. So only about uh, maybe a third of the city is actually fully densely populated on there. And so this is the Copacut Reservoir. This is taken from, there's a fire tower out in the, the, what's called the reservation. It's about 75 feet high, and I, I went up there uh, and took some pictures from around there. So this is looking at the, the Copacut Reservoir. And then this is looking back at, oop, this is looking back at North Watupa Pond. This is the water treatment plant right here. And these are some of the water towers. This was the original, that, that steeple, it almost looks like a church steeple or something. That was the original water tower in the city of Fall River. And they built this stone structure around it, but there's a tank inside. And the reason they put it on the high areas is to provide the pressure so that we can have pressure in our homes. And then looking, uh, this, is, uh, this is one of our student projects uh, at one time on South Otupa Pond. I don't know if people, uh, anybody from, uh, from here, uh, this is Ray Phillips, who is in our program. He's now in our IT, ITS department. And uh, we were out on South Otupa Pond. Oop. Oh, on, wait a minute. We were out on South Otupa Pond. He's doing dissolved oxygen measurements. He is... Uh, this is uh, Mike Calvin and Tony Ferry, and they actually ended up w working at the water treatment plants. Uh, Tony was at one of the, uh, uh, he, he, Tony's been all around. Mike was at the, the Fall River Wastewater Treatment Plant working down there. So we are doing pH measurements here, and Tony's getting ready to take some coliform samples from the pond to do our, our monitoring. And now, this is actually a stream that connects two of the water supplies, connects uh, Stafford Pond to South Watupa Pond. This is called Sucker Brook. And so when we think of, you know, when, why we have to treat our water, this is why, you know, people have abused these areas quite a bit in the past. And so this is looking at one area. This is looking down from that area. And you can see all the uh, mess that's there. There's, that's, right there is actually a, a full couch, full-size couch that's in the water. And here's crates, and there's a sink over there. There's another, uh, that's not a couch, but a big board or something. So This is called Trash from the Planet. Yes. <laughs> and again, this, is, this was a project my son did for his Eagle Scout project where we clean the section of that brook. It's called Sucker Brook. And the reason it's called Sucker Brook is because uh, around this time of year, you have carp that leave the South Watupa Pond and head up the, the stream. And it's a, it's a small stream, but there's carp in there like this that are going up there and they go up the river and head towards the, the uh, Stafford, Stafford Pond. And so this is some of the cleanup that we did. That's my son there in the middle, and some of his friends, some of the other scouts. 
And this is stuff we took out of there. And we even did get the kitchen sink. <laughs> so we, we took that out and it's tires and all this kind of, you know, that was one pile of things. So if we think, there was one section where people actually at the John Boyd daycare center, people took uh, the picnic tables that were for the daycare center and threw them over a six foot fence into the stream next to it. Now you, you, you wonder what, what the purpose of that was, but they did it. <laughs> yeah. And so this was the stream afterwards. This was that same stream that we saw before that was all cluttered with material looking down and everything. So, uh, and we actually did a study. I was doing a study of this stream on, on coliform counts. And we noticed that, uh, and coliform are bacteria that we have that are used as indicator organisms for pollution. Because we have coliform bacteria in our bodies. And without those bacteria, we can't survive because the bacteria will break down the materials in our guts and everything and, and provide the, dissolve it, so, or break it down so it can go into our bloodstream and all. And fecal coliform is one of the coliforms that comes from our waste. So I was doing a study of fecal coliform on this stream, and I found that it was going, it was very low, very low, very low, very low. All of a sudden it shot up. There was nothing, all of a sudden it shot up and then gradually made its way down. And I did this a number of times, went up and everything. So I went to the Board of Health and I said, there's something going on on the stream. And so we, we looked around with the Board of Health. They were able to go on the properties and everything. And there was one person on the stream that had rabbits. They were raising rabbits. And they put the pen right over the stream. So when the rabbits were going to the bathroom and everything, it was just falling down into the, into the stream. And that's how it was taken care of. And they were throwing the dead rabbits in the stream because we found dead rabbits when we were doing the, the cleanup and stuff. So it was, we were able to put a stop to that. But uh, that was from some of the things that we were, some studies that we were doing. Now, so this is the, the Fall River treatment plant. This was the original historical pump house. And this would pump the water out, and then it would just actually go into the city water supply. And the city water supply is, is very good at, at the time. It was one of the top waters in the state that they had. And so, but now we have the, the new treatment plant right here. And I'm going to go through what do we do at that treatment plant. And so this is a schematic of the treatment plant right here. This is the North Wetupper Pond right here. And so I'm going to go through these different steps to show you what's going on in the treatment plant. This is where the intake is right here for the pond. And the intake is basically a screened area. And the screening is to prevent any large things from coming in and getting, getting trapped into the pumps and all, keep fish out and things like that. So it's you have your, your screen right there. There's a little, little marker right there that marks the, the location. And, and it periodically, every year, they have to send a diver down to clean the stream and, and clean the screen and everything that's there. And then, so here's the raw intake right here. So the, it draws the water into what's called a raw water well. And so that water flows into this well, and then there's various pumps. And here's the, these powerful pumps right here that can pump the water into the treatment plant. They pump it out of that clear well into the treatment plant. So again, you know, one of the things is these pumps are, you know, we're supplying water 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 300, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So. When people say, well, we need another pump, they say, well, you got, you got one already. Why do you need another one? Well, these things are operating continuously, and you have to be able to shut them down periodically for maintenance. And am I going to shut down my pump and then say, okay, you, you can't use water for the next few days because we're turning our pump off. So, be, so we need these backup systems and, and a, a lot of duplication of systems so that you know, we can maintain this, this process. 
And also we can use, depending on what the flow is, we have different pumps, size pumps, so we can pump that out. Now we also have chemicals that we add into, this is a caustic, it's sodium hydroxide, which is used to adjust the pH of the water. So we adjust it, they adjust it at the beginning so that it's proper for the chemicals that we add in the chemical process of coagulation and flocculation. And I'll show you what that process is. And for coagulation and flocculation, there's another chemical, they use polyaluminum chloride, which when it's added to water, it creates a uh, aluminum hydroxide sludge, which it makes a flock, and I'll show you uh, pictures of the, of the flock in a moment. But the chemical gets added into this area right here. The chemical's added into the pipe line as it comes, and then it flows into the different areas. These are called flock tanks, or flock basins. And I'll show you what goes on there. But we have to add the chemical, and it mixes. You have to add some, the um, material itself, the aluminum, uh, aluminum sulfate or the polyaluminum chloride that's on there removes what's called alkalinity from the water. So we have to add some other alkalinity in there in the source so they can add some sodium hydroxide in there as a, an alkalinity source to maintain the pH at a certain level so that it, it, it forms the flock that we want and it precipitates out into the, uh, the flock. And so this feeds in, like there's flash mixers right here, but they're not using the flash mixers right now. What they're using is they actually have the ability, the way they put it into the pipe, it's mixing automatically in the pipe without needing a, a separate mixer, so that saves some uh, energy usage. Then it goes into these flock tanks, and it, uh, this, is a, this is what the flash mixer looks like. So the tanks that we're looking at are under the floor here, so the flow of the water would come this way. And then it flows into the, the flock tank. And in the flock tank, we have mixers. There's four mixers on there, which are moving slowly. Now, this flock is almost like snowflakes that come out, that precipitate. And when the thing turns around, it makes the snowflakes move slowly so that they attach any particles like plankton or colloids or silt or clay particles that are in the water stick to it. And then, it may, and then in the slow mixing on there, the smaller flock particles attach to the largest flock particles so they get heavier. And these are the, the flock mixes right here. There's one here, one there, and there's three of these, and there's one over here and one over there, and so there's three of these tanks in the system. And then this is looking in, they have a light in there so you can see, and I'll show you the next slide. So this is what it looks like. It almost looks like a snow globe. You know when you shake the snow globe and you get all, this, all these particles? So there's all these particles of, of the aluminum hydroxide sludge, or, or flock particles, they're not sludge yet. And then from there, after it mixes slowly in there, it moves into a large settling basin. And in this large settling basin, that allows that flock material to settle down. And these are fairly large. And you see it goes down. This is where they, it comes out. And so this is looking outside. And the flock tanks run, or the sedimentation basins run from right here all the way down here to here. So they're very large basins, but we have to make it so that the water is slowed down and it has a detention time, a certain time in there, so it allows time for that flock material to settle out before it goes out into the next step. And the next step is the filters. And these are rapid sand filters, and so the water moves into these filters. Here's what it looks like from the, the top. And there's, you can see the size of, of these filters here. So they're fairly large. And the water comes in from the top, comes in on the sides, and it flows by gravity through the sand. And as it moves through the sand, any 
material that didn't settle out gets filtered out in these, uh, in these large filters. Now, one thing that happens is periodically it's going to reach a point where the filter gets clogged. And so you have to do what's called back washing. So you actually have to have the water flowing back up. So the water's going downwards when it's filtering, but then when you want to clean it, you make the water flow upwards. So it washes that stuff off the, off the top of the filter. And this is the uh, little bridge. They have a special device that actually moves. And you see how there's little segments? It goes back and forth and it cleans one, back, back washes one segment at a time. And it moves and does that and then it keeps going back and stuff and so that it, you are constantly cleaning all those things so that the water can flow through and, and get through clearly. Oh. And then this is the uh, filter uh, or the turbidity, which is one of the things that we're trying to, to remove in the process. And we can see that this is the, the turbidity right, oops, the turbidity right here coming out of the sedimentation basin is about 0.24 NTUs, and NTUs stand for nephlometric turbidity units. It's a certain type of measurement of turbidity. And so we can see after it's gone through the, so it's point. 0.294, but after it's gone through the filter, this is 0.081, this is 0.12, this is 0.037, this is 0.058. So we're removing a lot of the turbidity. It's less than 0.1 NTUs. And then this is the, the, uh, the water from all the filters collects in here. And it's a little dark, but you know, if it was lighter, you could see how, you could see the bottom there, how clear this water is after it leaves the filter. So when the water leaves the filtration plant, it's quite, quite clear and clean. Now, then the water flows from that into what's called the finished water well. And in the finished water well, this is where we add our disinfectant because we have to make sure the main process of water treatment is to make the water safe for us to drink. So there are, are ways that, different ways of, of disinfecting, but chlorine is the most common, it's been, it's most commonly used disinfectant because it's, it's relatively cheap, it's easy to use, and it does a very effective job on there. But one thing about chlorine is there's things called disinfectant byproducts that you have to watch out for. And so if there's organic material present in the water and you treat it with chlorine, you can actually create what's known as trihalomethanes. And these trihalomethanes are actually carcinogens. So you can create some carcinogens in your process of treating the water. So what you have to do is you have to measure the organic material that's present in the water and you have to remove that prior to putting in the, the, the chlorine. So other places have used different types of, of chlorinated compounds, chloramines, ultraviolet light, uh, bromines and things like that as uh, disinfectants. Now another thing, that, and so this is one of the ways, the city has since changed this and just recently put in hypochlorite, which is bleach. So using chlorine gas in cylinders is a, is a fairly dangerous thing. You know, you have to, you, you can handle it safely and all, but it, it, you have to be trained in how you use it. it the hypochlorite is bleach like you have in a bottle. You know, you buy in a store and you add that. It's much safer and used. Yep. Um, why do they use chlorine to disinfect the water? I've always heard not to use the chlorine water whenever you're in the pool. Well, in, in a pool, you're, you're, you're in a, a higher concentration of some of that than in, in, the, in the drinking water. And so the, the chlorine is there and the chlorine is in the pool for the purpose of killing bacteria and making sure that, that the water's safe. So again, if you, if you don't like the, 
the thing with the chlorine, sometimes you can get a little filter and you can put it on your tap and you can actually extract the chlorine from there in the activated carbon in that filter so you can re remove the, the chlorine that's there. Uh, so it's, it's there and, and again, for the most part, you don't want to add as much, as more chemical than you need to, but we have to make sure also that we've killed the pathogens that are in there. So, yeah, we, we do drink water that has chlorine in it. And, uh, well, I, I, again, it depends on what the, the concentration of the chlorine. I wouldn't drink pool water for a number of reasons. <laughs> You know, you know, so it, it's, it's not necessarily just for the chlorine. The chlorine probably makes the pool water okay to, <laughs> to drink, but there's, there's other materials that are present in the water also from people swimming in there and stuff like that. So I, that, would I drink pool water? No, I wouldn't drink pool water. And so these are chlorine cylinders. These are one-ton cylinders that chlorine comes, and this is the chlorination equipment to try and control the level of chlorine gas that we put in there. This is called a, a type of flow metering device called a rotometer. There's a little float in there, and as the gas flows through there, the, uh, the float will rise and fall, and so you can tell how much chlorine you're putting in there. And these systems are all based on a vacuum system so that they're fairly safe. So as the, the water, you, you don't put the chlorine directly into the water, but you inject it into a stream of water. So as the stream of water flows, flows through a pipe by the Bernoulli principle, so the same, it's the same principle why, we, why an airplane flies is the same principle of how this works, is that a fluid moving quickly prov produces less pressure on the container that it's in. So the faster it moves through the pipe, it, it can actually create a suction. And so this suction draws the chlorine in and there are these vacuum valves along the way. So by the suction, by having the water flowing, it creates a suction that allows the chlorine to flow. If you shut off that thing of water, it shuts off the suction and so the valves shut off. There are multiple valves that shut off so they block the chlorine from from going if the water's not flowing. So there's a, a lot of these uh, safety systems in this, which you don't need when you're using the hypochlorite bleach. And so this is a scale that was used for uh, measuring how much chlorine that you were using from the tank, because you can actually measure how much chlorine is coming out of there. And then this is how uh, the uh, fluoride is added. It's added from a powder that drops into here and it's got a, a little uh, calculated kind of roller, that ro a little auger that puts the fluoride into the water, into, into that clear well. And there's some controversy over fluoride also having, you know, in the, in the water, but, you know, some people say that we don't need it anymore because there's so much fluoride in our toothpastes and things like that, that, you know, not necessarily, but, you know, fluoride can, in low doses that we put it in the water, it does have a, an effect on helping control deep tooth decay. But too much fluoride can actually have the reverse effect and actually cause bone decay and things like that. So that's why, you, I don't know if you've ever been to the dentist and you had a fluoride treatment and all and they tell you not to eat or drink for a thing because you don't want to swallow any of the stuff that you have in your, in your water from that fluoride. And some of these mouthwashes and all have we're putting in maybe a one pot per million of fluoride. If you look at the uh, fluoride in some of those things, it's a thousand pots per million and stuff. So it's like a thousand times more in some of these washes than would be in the water. And then this is the lab there because we do a lot of wa water analysis in the lab also every day f monitoring it because they're required by law to monitor the water. And a lot of the things that they're monitoring daily on here, so when we think about bottled water, you know, the, the tap water is probably monitored more than bottled water is. But yet we have a, we've created a demand, the companies have, have created a demand for bottled water. 
even though, you know, I, I do my stu tell my students, you know, how much does it cost when you, you get a bottle of water? It's probably, say, a dollar for a bottle of water. And that's about 16, 17 ounces. It's 128 ounces in a gallon, so it comes out to almost $7 a gallon or so by, with bottled water. Whereas, uh, right now, the average cost for $3.78 nationwide, we get 774 gallons of water. That's 100 cubic feet. And so, you know, when you think about one gallon of uh, bottled water for $7, and 774 gallons of tap water for three dollars and 78 cents. You know that's a, you know quite a di quite a big difference. And so these are the pumps that pump the water into the distribution system. And so from this system now the finished water line, it goes into the distribution system. These are recorders that show the level of water in each of the water towers so they know how much water is in there and they can pump when it needs so that we can maintain the pressure in our house because there's seven water towers. Oh, we go. We got another one too uh, in, uh, in the new one in the industrial park now. And so these are some looking at some of the water towers right here. There's two of them and there's some. If you look around an area you can see all the high points of the city have water towers. Now, so that brings us to the water in our faucet. Then after our faucet, now the water goes through the sewer lines throughout the city and ends up down over here in the wastewater treatment plant. And so here's the Fall River Wastewater Treatment Plant. This is the state line right here between uh, Massachusetts and Rhode Island. So this is the the wastewater treatment plant. This used to be a site of actually an amusement park. It was Sandy Beach Amusement Park back, it was destroyed by the 1938 hurricane. And there were rides and everything down there. There was Sandy Beach and all, and, and all, all in this area. And uh, so now it was uh, put as a primary treatment plant back in the 40s and then upgraded in the late 70s and early 80s to a secondary treatment facility. So this is the uh, Headworks building where this is where the water first comes in from the wastewater treatment plant. And this is the, in that system, there's actually a air, uh, this is air quality control. It, so it, it actually captures the odors and all that are in there so that, and it chemically treats the air so we get odor free air coming out of there. And that was one of the upgrades that recently occurred uh, actually in the 80s. And then the first thing as the, the water comes in, it goes through, the water comes down and it, oh, uh, you can't quite see it that well because of the darkness, but there's big screens right here. And the water first passes through large screens that capture any materials and all. And then there's actually mechanical things almost like the screens are like a comb, so you get mechanical things that come by and, and clean the stuff off the screen. It's funny, they've gotten money off those screens and things like that, and uh, had someone actually got a found from diamond, like loose diamonds and stuff and in there. And uh, so I, I, was, I always tell my, one time we were in a supermarket, and I saw the cash, the woman, at the cash register, she was doing something with the change and she stuck a dollar bill in her mouth and then she was working and I told my son, I said, don't ever do that. I said, because I know where that's been. <laughs> you know, and, and it's, uh, so there's, uh, don't, don't deal with money. So it goes through these screens and then from there, this, this takes the screenings out and it goes into a dumpster and goes into the, the landfill. Then this is a, we're downstairs and these are the walls. Inside here are giant grit chambers, which are to remove sand and everything from the, from the water. And this is important because sand, if it gets into pipes, just think of, we use things, sand blasting and everything to, to pipe. Sand getting into a pump and everything will actually wear the pump off and you can actually wear holes right in the, 
right in the, uh, the impellers. So it goes into a grit chamber, and it's aerated also to kind of spruce up the thing. Then this is the septage receiving station right here. Septic trucks will come in, and they tie up into here, and there's two 40,000-gallon tanks here to collect, or two 20,000-gallon tanks to collect the septage that comes in, and then the septage is, is fed into the system. And there was one time where we were actually receiving, we were the, the cheapest in the state, basically, to receive septage at $1.90 uh, a thousand gallons. So people were coming from almost towards Boston because it was worth their while to travel down to drop off their septage. So we were getting almost 100,000 gallons of septage a day coming in there. And the aeration tanks were built for 40,000. So we finally made it so that they passed legislation like local l limits that it could only be from the abutting towns and stuff. But, uh, you know, so it does have a severe impact on the treatment plant, the uh, high amount that came in. And so the first part of the thing is primary treatment, which is large settling tanks, which allow the heavier solids to settle out. And this is what a clarifier looks like. And you know, see, you got seagulls there. They're kind of eating on the stuff that's around there. Seagulls have a lot of parasites in them and stuff. So, <laughs> but they they catch the stuff there, and they they uh, feed on a lot of the stuff that comes in. And this is what one of those tanks looks like empty. The water comes in at the center, and this ring keeps it from just short circuiting and going off the side. It makes it go into the clarifier. And then these things down here are rakes, this, so the sludge is going to settle down. And as these things turn around, it moves the sludge down towards the center where the sludge can be removed from the clarifier. And then the effluent goes over these weirs right here. There's a barrier right here that c catches any floatable materials. And then the water goes underneath that barrier and goes over, the, un over those railings, or are called weirs. These are called sawtooth weirs because it looks like a sawtooth. And this is that barrier that keeps floating stuff on the back of it. And then the floating material is actually removed in what's called a scum pit. And uh, so it, there's a little beach. And so the thing comes by, and the scum that's floating on the top, there's a skimmer arm that goes around and removes the stuff off the top. And then that's the, this is called, this is the area where the scum gets removed from and it goes down another pipe and leaves the, the plant there. And then this is the little hopper where the uh, sludge goes in and is removed by another pump. And so these are some of the pumps. There are large pumps that need to pump the sludge around in the treatment plant. So we pump it from the bottom of the clarifier into a thickener building and these are the the thickener buildings right here, where the sludge gets thicker, and then it moves into this area where the sludge gets squeezed to remove as much water out of it as possible. And then from here, the water leaves. Right, It goes right by here, and there's large pumps right here that move the water up, because this is a higher elevation than this, so we have to move the water up. And this is the secondary treatment area. And so these are the pumps that are pumping the water. There's large submersible pumps right here that pump the water up to the secondary part of the plant. And then these, these areas inside these tanks are where the activated sludge is. It's, it's bacteria and other organisms, protozoans. There's about a, 2 million gallons of bacteria and all that are cultured in those areas. So when you think about biotechnology and you're culturing these little small vats of things, in a wastewater treatment plant we're culturing millions of gallons of organisms because the organisms do the work for us. They break down the waste and they remove the organics material from the, from the waste. And, oops. and these are the mixes right here that mix the material as it comes in. And this is a pure oxygen system here. So we take the, uh, this is the, it's called a pressurized swing absorption. 
inside these little canisters, there's little pellets of, of Georgia clay. And when you pressurize the system, the clay pellets bind the nitrogen. So now air is 78% nitrogen and 20% oxygen. So if the nitrogen gets bound, then you pull the oxygen off of there. And now you have almost pure oxygen that comes off. And this system is designed to make about 21 tons of oxygen a day coming from, from here. And this is a backup system right here of liquid oxygen. So just in case something goes down here, we have the oxygen to supply to the system. And these are the compressors and all for aerating the system. And this is, this device is, this is a bunch of valves and everything because you have these three things and it's called pressurized swing adsorption. So you have to pressurize one container, then you depressurize it, then you flush it with another. So you have this constant cycle of pressurizing, depressurizing, and the nitrogen gets blown off into the atmosphere. So all this system is called a skid, and this is all the different valving and everything that's con to control that whole system. And then this is what it looks like from the outside. There's those, uh, again, this is the, the liquid oxygen, and this is the... Uh, uh, pressurized swing, this is the containers of the clay. And then this is a, an operator, he's measuring the level of sludge that's in, he's using a, right there, this is called a sludge judge, and it's actually a, a long tube that you lower down into it, and it has a little, little ball at the end of it, and so as you're lowering it down, it makes a core sample through the sludge, then you give it a little jerk, and that, that ball goes down and sits and locks the flow, the sludge in. So now you can take it up and you can measure the level of sludge that's in the, in the line. And this is the secondary clarifiers. So you can see the, the uh, clear water is coming off here, right there. And then here, this is that sludge judge and this is the little foot valve on there. So you can see the level of sludge right in here that's at the bottom, and there's the clear water coming off the side. And these are the heart, these are the pumps, the heart of the treatment system, because you don't just, the, the, the bacteria doesn't just go through the system once, it's recycled, because you feed it with food, then it goes into the clarifiers, and while it's in the clarifier, the bacteria are feeding on the food that they took in, and then you recycle them back, because now they're hungry again, and you put them back. And so the idea, what the operator has to do is control the amount of sludge and the age of the sludge and everything that's in there because if it gets too old, it's the bacteria on is healthy and they're not gonna break down the waste as much. If it's too young, they don't break down the waste as much. So there's a, there's a whole science involved with determining how much sludge is actually that you need and the age of the, the sludge that's on there. And these are the, the waste sludge pumps for pumping the, the sludge out of the, the clarifiers. And then from there it goes into, the water comes, leaves here, goes through a, a flow measuring device called the partial flume right here, and then it comes down through here. And this is where the chlorine is added. And these are the tanks of the hypochlorite. They use hypochlorite here now. They used to use chlorine, but now they use hypo, the bleach the hypochlorite, and then it goes from here into these, uh, these are called the chlorination basins, and you can see how it's almost like a, you know, going almost like a, you know, you know, a maze where it goes like that, and the purpose of that is to allow enough time for the bacteria to, the chlorine to be in contact with the water so it can do its disinfection. And so these are the tanks of hypochlorite over here. And these are the samplers, because we have to take samples at different areas. This was a tour we were on. And these are the sodium hypochlorite pumps that pump the... And so then what we have from there, these are the, the chlorine areas right there, that chlorine basin. And then now what we have to do, they found that 
there was a time where we were required to discharge our effluent at a 0.5 to 1.5 milligrams per liter of chlorine, putting it into the bay. We discharge into the Mount Hope Bay. But they found through studies that that was enough to cause some negative effects on the environment. So we, now they have to dechlorinate. So they add another chemical and they're using sodium bisulfite, which actually reacts with the chlorine to remove it from the, the waste stream or it takes it from the, the uh, disinfecting type of action of the chlorine. It binds it with it so that it's not causing a uh, uh, problem when it goes into the environment. So where we used to do 0.5 to 1.5 chlorine discharge, the now permit is 0.04 milligrams per liter, which is essentially removing all the chlorine that we have before it can go out into the environment. And then this is the outfall right here in Mount Hope Bay. And so now we have the solids handling facility. These are the thickeners, like I said, and then this is what a thickener looks like, a clarifier basically, but it, it allows the sludge to thicken more. And then from there, it goes into the solids handling building. And this is, again, air treatment right here. So it takes the air from here, treats it chemically to remove the odors, and then it goes out. And then we have these large filter presses, which squeeze the sludge to squeeze the water out of the sludge, because you don't want to be, uh, you, want, you don't want to have to deal with, with heavier sludge, you know, because you're paying for to, to deal with water. So we try and get rid of as much water as possible. And here's the sludge uh, right there. It's a sludge cake coming off there. And now, right uh, from there, they used to burn the sludge in an incinerator. And here the, you can see the, the fire burning in there. And the sludge would go in there. It was a multiple hearth furnace. So it would go in the top and dry completely then go into burning areas and then go into a cooling area. And it was funny, when we first got this all approved by the, because when I, I used to work at the wastewater treatment plant, and we had it going, we told the neighborhood that the incinerator's going, and there was nothing coming out the stack. So they were complaining that we weren't actually burning anything because nothing's coming out the stack. And we said, that's because the systems are working properly. You shouldn't see anything coming out the stack. So we actually brought the film TV crews in to show that we were actually burning the sludge. And it was on the news that we were actually burning the stuff. It was just nothing was coming out of the stack because the system was working properly to remove the, the particles from there. And so this was the incinerator stack right here. And so this is, this is the, the, all the pollution control equipment for the incinerator. Here's the incinerator over here, and all the air would come out of there and go through various ways to clean it before it would go out. And then there's the sludge, you know, because the sludge can go to a landfill if you can't burn it. And so it's being treated with lime. The lime holds the materials in there. And now the last thing is the CSO project, which was the city of Fall River was the first city in the nation to be under federal court order to eliminate its combined sewer overflows, which are combinations of rainwater and, and sewage that go into the ocean or whatever the body of water is when it, when it rains. And so here is the, what they did was they built a pipeline underneath the city. It's a 20-foot 20 20 diameter pipe that's about three miles long. And it catches, there used to be 19 combined sewer overflows that would flow oop, into the Quickishan River, flow into the Taunton River, and also flow into Mount Hope Bay. And because part of Fall River is up here. So this portion of the city was done with the tunnel. The northern portion of the city is done with treatment at pump stations that the things are directed to, and then it goes out into the, the ocean. So it's, it's treated. All this water that's captured, this can hold 86 million gallons, 
And what it would do, it fills this and it flows by gravity to the wastewater treatment plant down there. In a lot of places, they, ha they put these in and they have to pump it out of there. But in Fall River, it flows by gravity to it. And this is, so, this is looking at how the lines go. This, is the, this would be, you know, this, whoop, this would be the city compressed. And these are the main drop shafts where the sewers tie into. And then it goes into the flow down here. And there still is an overflow for that, that tunnel, which is the estimated there could be some times where you still could get an overflow. But the rest of it will flow gradually to the wastewater treatment plant and be treated rather than go into, directly out uh, into the uh, bay. It was funny. When I was a kid, I was out fishing at one place. And I was looking around, and you know there was uh, fecal matter floating around and everything. And I'm wondering, gee, where is that? coming from, you know, the houses and everything. It wasn't until later on and I worked at the plant that I realized what I was fishing off of was one of those combined sewer overflows. And they had problems at the time. They weren't cleaned out and everything, so they were actually getting dry weather overflows at, at the times. And so it was uh, <laughs> live and learn, as they say. <laughs> and so this is where the area where the... the thing starts, where the uh, combined sewer overflow tunnel starts. And so what they did was they dug down right here a hole to expose the granite face. And there's granite under the city of Fall River as a bedrock. And the guys who did this tunneling were the same guys that did the tunnel between England and France. And they did the tunnels in South Africa and all. And they said this was the best granite they had ever cut through in the, in the world when they've done stuff, and it, which made it very uh, economic because this is the tool that they use. This is called a mole, and these are all bits on here. So this is the size of the, the hole that they'll drill, and it has a whole train behind it. And this contains a whole machine shop and everything because when you're down there and something happens, you're not going to want to pull this thing back. So you have to work on it and everything. And also these are cars behind here where all the material that would be cut off would be put in so then you can break it, take it out by a train. And so here's the, the start of it when they were first cutting into the making the first cut. And you can see these are where all the, all the blades are. So they could do about 30 to 60 feet a day. That was about how long it would take to, to cut through that area. And this is me down in the, the tunnel. And so you can see the, the rock. This is just the face of the granite all around like this. Now, what was good about this was they didn't have to grout it. Because normally what you do is when you cut through there, you have to grout it to seal it to keep the water in. They didn't have to do that with this because it was such solid granite. So the machine could actually, once they were done, they could bring it back. Whereas most places, they have to just drill it a little further and then seal it up down there. So they saved you know, a million, couple of million dollars for this machine and everything by being able to bring it, bring it back. And so I said I'd talk about careers quickly. We have a $602,000 grant for training for water and wastewater treatment systems here. And I've put some, I have information there about our programs. And right now, the careers in the water and wastewater field are wide open. There are, just this week, I got three job, looking for three job offers for people throughout two in Fall River and one in Marlboro, and I've got another one in Brockton and, I, and the other place, East Providence. So the people send me the things for our, our people. I don't have enough people to, to fill their positions. I'm hoping to expand our program and get more, peop get more people into the program, but it's hard to get people to come out of, uh, from high school and their first thought isn't working at a water treatment plant or a wastewater treatment plant. So, you know, oftentimes you get people coming from other careers that have tried something else and didn't work, and then they come back. So we're hoping to make the awareness into other, other, other areas and work. And we bring high schools in here to see the, our blue center and everything and work with there and do training and uh, 
So we're trying to, and I'm making uh, programs now that are hybrid and online programs, so students only have to actually come to college a half a day a week in order to, to fulfill the stuff on the program. And so we're trying to get it so people who are already in the field can advance themselves and stuff. So it's a, it's a, it's a tough thing trying to get people to come into, but they're full-time jobs, full benefits, overtime, you know, anything that you, you want, you get it, yeah. What's the starting, starting salaries are in the range of about 18 to $20 an hour coming out, right, say from taking a class here or, it would, you know, you don't even need your associate degree and, and you can be making that. And uh, some places it's $25 an hour, depending on, uh, and you can, right now you can get a job almost anywhere in the country because everybody's hurting for people. Yes, we have uh, the associate degree program and a certificate program. We're launching two new certificate programs in the fall, one for drinking water, and now we're calling it, rather than wastewater, we're calling it clean water technology because they're trying to change the image of stuff as being not water is not wasted. It has to be reused and cleaned and put back into use. Thank you. Again, thank you all for coming. and. Uh,